Uh, hello, everybody. This is going to be a, uh, a lecture uh, primarily on how to do this problem, which is going to be involving uh, lots and lots of stuff that we have already learned, plus uh, the newer stuff. Now, this particular problem is we're going to have a, uh, a bullet that has a mass of 25 grams going at 400 meters per second, and it's going to hit this wood that is made out of pine um, that measures 25 by 25 by 50 centimeters. Um, but it's constrained. It is constrained down here. So when this bullet hits, it's going to cause this block of wood to tilt up. So my question for um, this particular thing is going, does, the, um, does this block of wood topple over? Okay, that's going to be our question. Now, this, um, this question involves a lot of stuff that we have learned. So we're going to have to bring in uh, a lot of those things um, and in class, when I've given this lecture, I'm trying to elicit um, ideas from, uh, from the students that are in the class. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of um, ask these questions um, Socratically. So I'm gonna kind of throw them out there and then I'm gonna answer my own question, um, which hopefully is, would be the questions that you're gonna answer uh, out there. Now, this is very, very similar. This is uh, really set up to help you with the question of the day for 5-6, which is very similar. It is a bullet um, going into a cube. And again, it's asking what is the minimum velocity it takes to topple over. So we're going to be covering the same sorts of stuff, uh, except um, in a little bit of a different way. Okay. So um, again, we're going to have a bullet, and I'm sure you have um, perhaps imagined or even seen in a movie maybe where a bullet is going to hit something. And um, does, it, does it topple over or does it just stick? And how do we know that? Okay, so we're going to assume, okay, that this um, bullet is going to go in there and it is going to, uh, it is going to stick. So... Um, does that bullet impart enough energy? Does it impart enough energy to cause this block to rotate around to a point where it is going to topple over? Okay, so one, you guys, one of the things is which you intuitively know, which you intuitively know, but perhaps um, cannot express. How far does something have to tip over before it falls? Right. So if I'm standing here and I lean, at which point um, do, am I going to um, have to um, catch my balance? OK, so if we take a look at the center of mass. OK, now the center of mass is for a regular geometric object uh, is going to be at the geometric center, which we've talked about. Right. So. For our purposes on this, our center of mass is going to be right there at the geometric center, which would be over 12.5 centimeters, and it's going to be up 25 centimeters. Okay, makes sense. All right, so um, at what point, how much does it have to tilt? How much does it have to tilt before it falls over? And the answer is when the center of the mass is past the normal point, above the base of support. What does normal mean? Normal means the perpendicular, right? Like normal force, how much force is going perpendicular to the ground. So as we rotate this up, and let me kind of talk about this, is if we kind of draw this. Okay, so this would be our block, okay. Um, so think of this kind of going like this. So as this block topples over, right? As soon as the center of mass, soon as the center of mass of this block that's toppling goes past the point of support, when it goes past the point of support, then gravity will take over. Gravity will take over and it'll go the rest of the way, right? So that's really what we're trying to determine. Uh, and what is the mass, you guys, what is the mass of this block? Okay, now I'm saying that the mass of this, or that the, this wood block is going to be pine. So if we had a chunk of pine that was 25 by 25 by 50, that's about 10 by 10 by 20 inches, right? It's gonna be a pretty, uh, a pretty big chunk, 
right? Now, the density, the density of pine, we're going to say is 480 kilograms per cubic meters, 480 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, that would be about 0.48 grams per cubic centimeter. You may remember that uh, water uh, has a mass of one gram per cubic centimeter. Um, so the mass or the density of water is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, right? So obviously this wood would still float. It would have a lower density than water, which we uh, although we haven't studied, we uh, we know that to be true that wood that wood's going to be um, be floating. All right, regardless. So if we want to calculate the mass, density times volume, density times volume is going to give us uh, mass. So I already said our uh, density is four hundred and eighty kilograms per cubic meter. Now our volume is going to be 0.25 times 0.25 times um, 0.5, right? Mass length times width times height, okay? And that's going to equal to our mass, okay? So I'm going to say um, half of 480 is 240, and um, a quarter of 240 would be 60, and a quarter of 60 would be 15. Okay, so we can do the math, and we know the mass is 15 kilograms. So the mass of this is 15 kilograms. Now, what do we do? Okay, so what sorts of things have we been talking about? Well, one of the things we've been talking about most recently is um, angular momentum. And just like regular momentum, okay, uh, or linear momentum, which is mass times velocity, momentum is conserved. Momentum in an isolated system is going to be conserved unless an outside force in the case of linear momentum or an outside torque uh, in the case of angular momentum. Uh, now, this always bothered me when I was uh, taking physics is because if I'm just standing here, right, my momentum, my momentum is zero. And now I start to move. Now, as I start to move, my momentum is obviously going up, okay? Well, obviously the earth did not go that way, right? Um, and therefore, um, wait a minute. So if I move this way, okay, um, I could think of myself as the system, right? And now the outside force that would make me go that way would be the force of friction would be the force of friction if I'm the system, right? Now, even though the energy for me to move is coming from me, right? I push off, okay? But the frictional force, the frictional force is making me go this way, right? And that would be that outside force. If I talk about myself and the floor and therefore the earth as the system, okay? As I move this way, if I have a mass of 100 kilograms and I'm moving at one meter per second, right? That would give me um, a change in momentum, a change in momentum of 100 kilogram meters per second, which means the earth would have, if I go this way, then the earth momentum would have to be negative 100 kilogram meters per second. So that change in momentum or that change in velocity, remember, is going to be inversely proportional to the mass of myself and the earth. Okay, and since the Earth has such a much greater mass, then it's not really gonna not really gonna move any significant sort of way, All right? So that um, is we're gonna have the same thing. Now we're gonna end up talking about uh, angular. We're gonna talk about angular momentum. Okay, now what is angular momentum? So we know that the angular momentum is going to be r cross p r cross p but this is that cross product that had all those matrices and unless we have a three-dimensional uh, vector um uh with r or um p it doesn't it's not really going to help us right so we have a couple things that are going to be um easier than that as far as angular momentum goes one of those is I omega. If something is spinning, we're going to take 
the moment of inertia times its angular velocity. So remember that regular P, okay, regular momentum is equal to MV. So when we go through from our linear to our rotational, we have those analogies. So the angular analogy of linear momentum is angular momentum, which is L. The um, angular analogy to mass is our moment of inertia, is our moment of inertia. And our angular analogy to linear velocity is omega. So angular velocity is equal to I omega. Okay. Now, uh, it is also equal to uh, MVR, MVR sine theta. Okay, and that was kind of going back to the lecture um, from the other day. It says, how can you have a angular momentum of an object that is going straight? So the uh, angular momentum of an object going straight, remember, has to do with if this is our if this is our mass times velocity going in a straight line. We can have we can have angular momentum as long as with it is with respect to a certain point, let's say a point of pivot. And that point of pivot could be something like this, something down here. Now, this right here would be that perpendicular radius, that be that perpendicular radius. Um, and this angle is 90, so we would have MVR sine of 90, and the sine of 90 is one, okay? So our angular momentum would just be MV times that perpendicular radius. Okay, now that bugged me back when I was learning this stuff, but let's talk very briefly. What if we were talking about the angular momentum of the point back here, all right? Well, from this pivot point right here, this would be our R1, and this would be theta1. So if we said MV R1 sine theta1, right? We've got a right triangle, and the sine would be this opposite side, which would be R. What if we were doing it at a point further on? Let's we'll say we had a point right there. Now we would still have the same mass times velocity, but now our, we'll call this radius two, that would change. That would have become shorter. But our theta two, that angle would have been greater. Well, what is mv r two sine theta two? Well, it's still going to be this r. So as long as we know the perpendicular radius, okay, of a point of the pivot point versus the line that, or the, the straight line that the velocity is going, it's just gonna be this perpendicular radius. It's just gonna be this perpendicular radius. Okay, so this is our MVR sine theta, okay? Now let's go back to this I. How do we calculate? How do we calculate the moment of inertia? Now, I told you the moment of inertia was equal to the sum of the MR squares, okay? Which is certainly true. That's also equal to one over M times the integral of R squared dm. We did a little bit of that. The parallel axis theorem, the parallel axis theorem, I is equal to the I center of mass plus MD squared. And if you have an object, okay, if you have an object, let's say, um, I'm trying to find this. Okay. If we have an object that is rotating about its center, right? If we know the um, moment of inertia of this, right? But now it's going to rotate about a point here. Okay. Then the offset, which is going to be the difference between here and here, is going to become our D. Okay, so if we want to know what the moment of inertia of this is, we figure out the moment of inertia of the through the center of mass, and then we multiply by the whole mass of this times d squared, where this distance would be d. Okay, now the real, the, the easy answer here to find out the moment of inertia of a lot of different objects is to look on page 278. On page 278, we are going to find um, a list of formulas for calculating the moment of inertia of regular objects like 
a cylinder, a ring, a sphere, a rod, a rod rotating from the middle, a rod rotating from the end, which we have not talked about. We also um, are going to talk about the eye of a rectangular prism. Okay. And essentially, this is what we're going to have. And the eye of a rectangular prism is going to be 1 12th a squared plus b squared okay times the mass we could put the mass right there so 1 12th of m a squared plus b squared where we're going to have a and b okay so just the length and height uh, of the um of our rectangle so we're going to end up using this for our problem here um so we're talking about moment of inertia i omega and mv r sine theta so the one thing that we know about momentum whether it's linear momentum or angular momentum and that it is conserved as we talked about before okay in the absence of an outside force or an outside torque linear and angular momentum is conserved so that is going to be a big key into our problem here now if you've been working trying to work this out um, this question out there is still there's still more to do okay and what i am going to um kind of bring back to your memory is the question of the day um from about a month ago uh which was on 412 and on 412 we did what was called an elastic pendulum an elastic pendulum and i kind of set that up a little bit for you okay and that is going to be this part Okay, so in this elastic pendulum, let's move this over a little bit. Okay, so we have a bullet. Okay, it's going to hit a block. The block is initially uh, has a um, an initial velocity of zero. It's just hanging there. The bullet enters, goes through an inelastic collision. Okay, so that means the bullet's going to stick. Well, now we've just imparted some energy. So this is the momentum side, and this is the mechanical energy side. Okay, so what we really have is the first part, which is mass times velocity, and one half mv squared. So it's got both momentum and kinetic energy. Now it's going to hit here. It's going to transfer. It's going to transfer its momentum. It's going to transfer its momentum um, into that hanging block. Okay. But remember, in an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved. So we don't quite have the kinetic energy, but once it hits, right, it, that initial velocity of the bullet is going to give us an intermediate velocity which we can calculate from conservation of momentum. Now this intermediate velocity essentially becomes the initial velocity of our conservation of mechanical energy. So in our conservation of mechanical energy, um, we're gonna have uh, gravitational potential energy plus kinetic energy in the beginning is gonna equal to uh, gravitational potential energy plus kinetic energy final, right? So if we very strategically say that the center of mass of the object to begin with is zero, okay, then our um, gravitational potential energy is zero. That's going to cancel out. Uh, not to mention here, once this reaches its highest point in a pendulum, once it reaches its highest point, um, its velocity is going to be zero. So we're going to end up canceling this out right here. So now we can say that one half m g h is going to equal to one half m. Sorry, reverse this. We're going to have uh, one half m v squared is going to equal to m g h final. And we notice here that our masses cancel out, so we can get height is equal to sorry we can get velocity is equal to the square root of 2gh. Once we find, once we find our velocity, then we can go back. This right here goes there. And now we can find out the initial velocity of the bullet. Or we could have the initial velocity of the bullet, and we can figure out how high it goes. 
All right. So although today's question of the day, today's question of the day is not exactly the same, we are going to we are going to use um, our ideas, the same ideas of conservation, not of linear momentum, but of angular momentum and our conservation of uh, mechanical energy. And that's really the key. That's really the key here. So although we've got some more work to do here, we are going to say, OK, in the beginning, OK, in the beginning, we're going to have the bullet. Now, this bullet right there is going to have a angular momentum that's equal to mvr sine theta. Okay, and now uh, at the end, once it hits, this object is not going to continue in a straight line. It's going to rotate, and when it rotates, that's going to have this angular momentum that's equal to I omega, I omega. So this is essentially the momentum side, the momentum side of our um, problem. Now, since you guys, since we have all this information, we're gonna end up solving for omega. We're gonna end up solving for omega, and then we'll take it to the next stop, which is gonna be conservation of mechanical energy. All right, so, the mass, this is just the mass of the bullet, which is 0 0.025 times the velocity, which is 400 meters per second. Now, what is what is our I, R sine theta? Now, I don't think I specifically said it, but we can see in the diagram that this bullet is going to hit near the top 40 centimeters, 40 centimeters from the bottom. Now, that 40 centimeters from the bottom, that is our R of MV R sine theta. OK, so remember, we're just going to go straight across and then we're going to go down to the pivot point and that's going to be 40 centimeters. So that's going to be 0.4. Now, what is what is our I? OK, now the I of the center of mass of this object right here, OK, is going to be the mass divided by 12 times A squared plus B squared, where A squared is this and B squared is that, okay? But it's not rotating. It's not rotating about the center. It's rotating right there. So we're gonna use the parallel axis theorem and we're going to add to this uh, 112 M times the quantity of A squared plus B squared. We're going to add to that squared. We're gonna, we're gonna add to that um, the uh, MV squared. All right. So what is, what is our D? What is our D? And um, so we know that our D, we can just form a, um, a right triangle there. Okay. And we know the whole width is 25 centimeters. So we're going to say 0.125. Okay. We could do 12.5 centimeters, 12.5 centimeters, and halfway up is 25 centimeters, okay? And we can just do Pythagorean theorem. So we're gonna say 12.5 squared plus 25 squared equals takes the square root, and we're gonna get just a hair under 28, but we're gonna round up to 28. So this distance here, this diagonal is 28 centimeters, okay? Which is gonna be 0.28 meters, okay? So now we know we're going to plug up here. So our mass, we calculated it out from our density uh, and our volume was 15 divided by 12. We know our A is 0.25, which gets squared. We know our B is 0.5 squared. Uh, and that is our uh, 112 M times quantity of A squared plus B squared, okay? Now we're going to have plus our mass, which is again 15, and our distance, we just calculated it, was 0.28 squared. Okay. Now remember, this is all going to be our I here. So let's see if we can calculate that. So we're going to have uh, 15 divided by 12 times 0.25 squared plus 
0.5. We need to do that with parentheses. Sorry, 0.25 squared plus 0.5 squared equals 0.3125. Now multiply by 15 and divide by 12. Okay, we're at 0 0.39. 0 0.39. And now we're going to uh, add to that of 15 times 0.28 squared. And we're going to end up with 1.566. So um, I, got, I just have the total. So we're going to call it 1.57. That's equal to our I. So this is going to be 1.57. Okay. And omega, and so if we divide both sides by 1.57, we can calculate what our omega is. All right, let's see if I get this times 0 0.025 times 400 times 0.4, and I'm getting 2.55. Okay, so our omega is equal to 2.55. All right. That would be radians per second. All right, so that was our momentum side. All right, you guys, I'm gonna erase some of this. Uh, and now we're gonna go to our conservation of mechanical energy, conservation of mechanical energy side. All right, so let's get rid of this. All right. So now we're going to have, okay, from our ballistic pendulum, from our ballistic pendulum um, problem, we're going to have um, um, MGH initial plus one half MV squared is equal to MGH final plus one half uh, MV squared. Okay, now again, we're going to make, we're going to make um, H equals zero here, H equals zero at the center of mass, right? And if we make that H equals zero at the center of mass, then we are going to get rid of this, okay? Uh, and this is not, you guys, this thing is not going to move translationally. It's not going to go this way. Okay. But what it's going to do is it's going to rotate. So we don't want the linear kinetic energy. We want the angular kinetic energy. Okay. So just a reminder, our angular equivalent of mass is going to be um, I and our angular equivalent equivalent of um, linear velocity is uh, translational, velo I mean, angular velocity. So now we have this. Now, um, essentially what we want here is if it reaches right at the top there, right at the top, okay, and it stays there, that would be that minimum. That would be that minimum velocity that it would take. So we're going to make that assumption that it gets to the minimum. All right, so um, that means um, we are going to get rid of this. And now we want to know um, what is our um, height? Okay, so now how high does it have to go? How high does it have to go in before it topples over, right? Okay, so again, we're going to talk about this, and this center of mass has got to go from here to here. As soon as it reaches this point, right, it goes any farther, then it's going to end up toppling over. So really, what is this H? Now, remember, we calculated the hypotenuse to be 28 centimeters. So if this rotates 45 degrees, right, then right where the base of support, that's going to be 28. We started out with 5. So this is three centimeters. This is three centimeters, okay? 0 0.03 meters. That is really uh, sort of the minimum there, okay? So now we just need to combine this. We're essentially gonna calculate what this H is from, our, from this, right? So we're gonna have 
one half of our I. Now our I was before 1.57, 1.57, and our omega was 2.55. That gets squared. This is gonna equal to our mass. Now our mass was 15, and our gravity was 9.8. And now we're going to get H, right? So when we solve for this H, if this H is greater than 0 0.03, it will have toppled over. If it is less than three, then it would have kind of come up and then um, went back down. All right. So we're going to divide this by 15 and 9.8. And now we can calculate. Now we can calculate what our H is. So 2.55 squared times 1.57 divided by 2 divided by 15 divided by 9.8 and that is equal to our h equal to here is going to be 0 0.035 0 0.035 okay that means what that means is is this had enough energy it had enough energy to um topple over because this right here, this meters, is going to be greater than that minimum amount, which was 0 0.03. All right. So you can see that we added a lot of things. We added a lot of things in here that were from the past plus this chapter right here. Now, what you're going to do in today's question of the day, okay, is all the numbers that I give you, which are going to be kind of similar to there, but it's all variables all the variables and what you are going to do is calculate for the minimum velocity you're going to calculate for the minimum velocity so the math because you're not able to actually put in numbers you're going to have to keep all the variables a lot of which are going to cancel out but you're going to have to end up with some geometry here you're going to, have to end up with some geometry here um, and it can be a little bit cumbersome but you're going to end up okay remember that we had L is equal to M V uh, R sine theta. Okay, you're going to end up solving for V, and everything else is going to go. Everything else is going to go to the other side. All right, so it's a little bit tricky, but it's the same basic idea. Okay, you kind of have to work backwards a little bit. Um, but that is our lecture, and that is really to help you with the question of the day five six. All right, we'll talk to you guys next time.